There you go. Okay, Kurt, it's all yours. I'm away. So before I get into the presentation, give you a little briefing on uh, solar system dynamics, particularly the uh, sun and the moon and the, and the uh, and the Earth, which is what we have these brief brief eclipses. So this can be the sun, and pretend this is the Earth for now. All right, so Earth goes around the sun once a year. Now, if we can see the stars in daylight, we can see the sun slowly moving through certain constellations as the Earth is going around it. So those constellations that it goes through, they're the ones you see in the horoscope, the, the zodiac constellations. And uh, 100 years ago, they they broke up the entire sky into just 88 constellations and changed the borders on them and defined those. So now actually the sun goes through 13 of these constellations. We won't see that in the horoscopes because they don't go by constellations, they go by signs. Okay, so this is now the Earth. And so as Earth is going around the sun, the moon is going around the Earth. It takes about 27.3 days to go around once. Uh, we go by full moon and, and new moon, things like that, the lunar phases. So it's actually about 29 and a half days from one full moon to the next because the Earth is moving along as the, as the moon is going around the Earth. Now, the um, you know, that 29 and a half day period, its orbit is not circular, it's elliptical. So its distance from the Earth can be, uh, at perigee, its closest can be as close as about 356,000 uh, kilometers. And at its farthest, apogee, it can be as much as about 406,000 kilometers. So that difference in distance uh, plays a role in how we can see eclipses. Right? So if you want to have a total eclipse, it has to be at one of the nearer points there. And another thing about the moon's orbit, Moon's orbit is tilted to the Earth's, the Earth's orbit. So that path that the sun would make through the sky or Earth's orbit around the sun, that's called the ecliptic. And now the moon's orbit is tilted to the ecliptic by about five degrees. And so sometimes it passes up above the ecliptic and a couple of weeks later, it goes down below the ecliptic. So it's the ascending node and descending node. And if we have a new moon somewhere near those uh, nodes, then we can have an eclipse. Otherwise, the where it's tilted five degrees and the moon is only about half a degree wide in the sky. Hold your pinky out arm's length. That's one degree of sky. So the moon only covers about half your pinky there. So it'd be quite a bit above the sun or quite a bit below the sun during a new moon. We wouldn't get an eclipse. Another thing about the uh, it's the tilt, right? It's wobble as well like that wobbles toward the, the direction of the moon coming to you that plays a little bit of a role too we'll talk about that when i get into it all right so i'll share it and bring it up here all right so we're going to talk about it's better you can see it Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, what you're going to see during the eclipse, um, how to see it safely, and where to see it. And you're very, very lucky. You're quite close to the center of the, uh, of the eclipse shadow in there. You have a lot of people coming up to visit you on, on April 8th. So it's April 8th of this year that we have the first total eclipse in New Brunswick since 1972. And fortunately for you, that path also passed through Miramichi, but just barely. The southern limit of it passed through a current Miramichi, but Newcastle was outside the shadow. Chatham was just inside of it. And it's up around, it was better up around the, uh, the peninsula in the, north, in the northeast. All right, so we have different types of eclipses. We have a partial eclipse, which you see like this. And if we're going to have a total eclipse, it's going to go these, through these partial phases. Now, the partial ones, uh, typically we get maybe one or two a, a decade. This year, we're very, very fortunate. We're having seven of them. We've already had two partial eclipses. Right? So with this, the, uh, the we're just outside of the uh, moon's shadow. So at the moon's distance, um, when it casts a shadow onto the Earth, when we have a new moon, uh, that shadow is only at one or 200 kilometers wide. Right? So if you happen to be within that very narrow one, 
you'll get to see the total eclipse. Outside of it, outside of it, you get a partial eclipse. And it can be varying ones like this April in say St. John and Campbellton, it'd be about 99% covered by the sun. Right? But you have to wear safety glasses, the eclipse glasses, or some other alternative during that entire eclipse. Those people that are within the shadow, and we'll see later where that is, during that brief period of fatality, you don't need to wear the you don't need to wear any special glasses there. In fact, you shouldn't because you'll miss what they do the best part of the eclipse. So you get these uh, partial ones like that. Another one is an annular eclipse, and that happens if we have the moon at its close to apogee, its farther point away. So maybe a third of the time it might be that that farther distance. So this is the uh, moon at perigee and the moon at apogee. It's only about a, like a ten percent difference there. And if you want, you don't see them. You don't see them side by side like that in the sky. Mm -hmm. but, um, they do. And then it's a little bit brighter, but that might not be easy to see as well. But if we had the, the, uh, the solar eclipse, total solar eclipse, or what should be one, when we're at the lower size here, the farther distance, the moon's not going to be big enough to completely cover the sun. Right? See, so the the sun is um, about 109 times wider than the moon is. Right, and it's um, so we looked at the. Uh, the two balls I had up there before. Uh, the big one that was the Earth. If uh, that's how big the Earth really is, the moon would have been about that size as well. The moon is just a little bit more than a quarter of the diameter of the Earth. And at that size that I showed you, they'd be about 10 meters apart. Uh, sorry, three meters apart, about 10 feet. And the sun at that uh, size and distance would be about 1.2 kilometers away and about uh, 11 uh, meters uh, wider or wide. And so if we have the moon at a near apogee, we're gonna have, it's not gonna cover the sun, so we're gonna see an eclipse like this. We call that the annual eclipse because it's an annual of sunlight around the outside. And you would need safety glasses, the eclipse glasses to watch that. You don't always get an airplane there. And the total eclipse, when the moon is maybe you know a little bit more than uh, than halfway uh, at its average distance and a little bit closer, farther away, most of the time you're going to get this total eclipse when it covers it completely. Now, depending where you are within that shadow, it could be within that shadow for maybe 10 seconds. You might be in it for you know, three or four minutes. And the mirror machine this year, I think there's something like three minutes and 10 seconds, which is very good. And so that path is very, very narrow. And we have one that's called a hybrid. And we get these. If the moon is at the distance, right at that distance where a little bit of difference makes it, it could be a total eclipse or it could be an annular eclipse. So here we have the uh, new moon happening here. And that moon is just at that distance where it could be either way. So the Earth is rotating this way and the moon's moving this way. The moon is actually moving west to east. So if you're having a morning eclipse here that comes into the sunshine and you got the moon here, it's already an eclipse and casting a shadow down in here. It's about, if you're here, the moon is about uh, 6,000 times farther away than for people on here. So that people here get to see a total eclipse, but that extra 6,000 kilometers mean they don't get to see a total eclipse, they get an annual eclipse. So depending where you are, you're seeing it in the morning or the evening, you are seeing it midday, makes a difference between whether you see a total eclipse or an annual eclipse. And here are the times and dates for the other five partial eclipses that are coming up this year. So we've got a partial eclipse next year as well. It's in March. Now, they're very rare to have a total eclipse in any one spot. Very fortunate for you. You saw one in 1972. You'll see one this year. In much of New Brunswick, um, I know we certainly haven't seen one since before 1900, and I haven't gone back farther to see just when we did have the last one, but a friend of mine has claimed it is year 942 AD. So it's been over a thousand years since a good part of New Brunswick has had a total eclipse going through. So these are the eclipses can happen twice a year. So here's the sun moving along the ecliptic, 
right? So the ecliptic, of course, it's a, it's a circle, 360 degrees, and the sun uh, makes, or the earth makes that orbit once every 365 days. So from our perspective, it looks like the sun is moving about uh, one degree per day, which is approximately twice its diameter. And so if it comes in a point, here's the, uh, the ascending node here, we've got the descending node on the other side of the orbit. And so if the if a new moon occurs anywhere within this period here, it can cross in front of the sun. So if it happens in here or over in here, we're certainly going to get a partial eclipse. And the farther along it is, the deeper that eclipse is going to be, more of it's going to be covered up. Right, so this is uh, 36 degrees, it's roughly you know, about seven, uh, seven no, pardon me, five weeks. We have an eclipse period. And then just under six months later, we have another eclipse period. That, because it's not six months, that's due to the Earth's wobble or the moon's wobble there in its orbit. And so it's moving toward that area, wobbling toward this. So this um, node here will move in this direction and the uh, middle of that next period in the next year will be about 19 days earlier in the year. All right, so the maximum time for an eclipse can be about seven minutes and 29 seconds. And you can imagine that's going to be very, very rare. So you can get a total eclipse only in this area in here. And this is only, it's just 12 degrees wide. So you have about a 12 uh, day period during this that you can get a total eclipse. So it's not gonna happen very often. And then to throw into the weather, things like that. And just a very, very small area of the earth gets covered by that time. And uh, okay, it's gonna cross the, you know, maybe a third of the earth, but still it's only a very narrow path where it's happening. So these sort of add up to give you a very, very slim chance of having a total eclipse in your area. Here's the size of the moon's shadow. And this was taken from the Mir space station in 1999, the, the Russian space station. So it's not very big. You can see how big the earth is here. There it is. And it's moving at roughly one or two kilometers per second in either you know, a westward direction, or eastward direction, like roughly. So what do we see? So this year, uh, these times might vary a couple of minutes from say the west side to the east side of the province. I think I did these for roughly around Heartland. So these might be happening Miramichi a couple of minutes later. So around 3.25 PM, we have first contact. So that's when you first notice the, the moon taking a little bite out of the sun on the right-hand side, on the western side of that, as the moon is moving west to east. We see it moving east to west throughout the sky at night, but that's because the Earth is rotating west to east. And so it makes that first bite there. And I'll take uh, this one will happen maybe take uh, 35 minutes or so to go through that entire partial phase. So the first while you're watching this, you need some safety, eye safety, eclipse glasses or a few other things that I'll be showing you. And slowly and slowly that'll be moving across the sun like that. And you'll see the sun moving slowly to the west as the, as the Earth rotates. Once you get maybe half of it covered, you start to notice it's going to be a little bit cooler. Right? And if things get cooled down like that, you probably notice the wind coming up, making it even worse. So you get this drop of temperature with the wind picking up, and that temperature can drop by about 10 degrees, depending on, on the different uh, factors going on there. So it's going like that. It could, could be boring. You're not going to watch the whole thing going on. So if you're Kept your family there with you, maybe one pair of eclipse glasses. You know, it's fine to trade them back and forth and give your body a look. Just make sure that nobody's looking at it without anti protection. I'll tell you later what happens if you do. As it's getting closer and closer, uh, you're a naturalist. Just take a walk around in nature, see what's happening. Get some nice shadows going on there. The sky starting to get maybe a little bit darker. And the animals, as you're getting closer and closer to totality, they think night is for them. So the birds will start to quiet down a bit and maybe get ready for, for a night. The uh, people with farms, they've noticed that the cows start to walk home as they're getting to night, so they can come back to be fed. And probably you know, two or three minutes later, it's daylight again, so they're all you know, confused. This is the shortest day we've ever, shortest night we've ever had. And so we're getting up now to the, about the last minute 
This is where something is quite subtle to see, it's called the shadow band. So you just have a narrow split after the sunlight. And with that, if our air, air movement up in the uh, upper atmosphere, that can make a little uh, shadow bands coming. So if you look on a, you've got a nice white surface there on, on, the, on the ground below you, you might see it's uh, maybe about a foot wide of a, a shadow, then light, a shadow and light, just sweeping it across the ground like that. And they're quite shot and quite subtle. You have to be actually looking for it and you pretty much need a white cover on the ground to pick out that for the contrast. April 8th, uh, a lot of New Brunswick might have a nice uh, natural white ground. Um, that's a lot of people walk through it and disturb the snow. So that's one thing you can maybe to, to watch out for, but you maybe don't spend a lot of time on it. Okay, it's getting cooler and cooler now and getting to that last little bit. So just a few seconds before totality, um, Take your glasses off, but don't look at the sun. And look to the west. And you might see the moon's shadow rushing toward you. This big black shadow coming toward you at a pretty good clip, like a kilometer per second. So here's a picture taken from Wyoming during the total eclipse there in 2017. These pictures are taken about a second apart. So here's the sky, and about a second later, you can see it. There's a darker area in here. That's the shadow rushing toward you. As you get even closer, you have to take a look around at the sky. You got a deep blue sky overhead, and you've got a 360 degree um, twilight all around you. Just the, uh, you want to see, you probably get the red colors all around, 360 degrees. Then you get into those last dying seconds of it. You have two things called Bailey beads, Bailey's beads, and the diamond ring. Now here's Bailey's beads, and this came for. Uh, Morris Bailey, he was uh, Francis Bailey. He was an astronomer in England in the 1840s. He wasn't the first to notice this, but he was the first one to record it. So the moon's outside it looks smooth to us. Uh, you've all seen pictures of craters and mountains on the moon. So there can be some deep craters and some mountain peaks along here. So as the moon is almost completely covering the sun, we get the last glimpse of sunlight coming say, through these craters or, or maybe between mountain peaks. So you get some flashing lights along the outside rim like that, just pretty much in the dying seconds of the uh, of the uh, eclipse there. Then you get that last little flash just when it ends, a brilliant flash like that. They call that one the diamond ring. And after that, totality. All right, so this is where things get loud. Not from nature, but from the, you're going to have probably a crowd of people there with you. This is a, you don't watch a total eclipse, you experience it. There's so many other things that take into account. You know, the sounds, you can feel the, the senses of the, the cooler air. People are going to be screaming and uh, shouting, weeping, and, and be, be confused. You think back thousands of years ago, and maybe not even that long in some areas, they really didn't know uh, what caused the eclipses. In places like uh, Babylonia three or 4,000 years ago, they were able to predict them. They knew they figured it out. A lot of areas they didn't. What they saw was the sun being eaten. Well, some areas the sun was being eaten by a dragon. And so they get really scared, really confused, and go out and make a lot of noise to chase that dragon away. And by gum, it works. So the next time they see that happening, they make a lot of noise to keep that dragon away from eating their sun. All right, so just keep your head together. And take a look around, see what's happening, and uh, you're going to get wrapped up in all of this because uh, you're, you're seeing something you've probably never seen before. Has anybody there ever seen a total eclipse? And I haven't seen one either. Oh, <laughs> so you're getting one of this from somebody who's read one, about one, it. One of us has seen one. Okay, where was that? In Alberta. Okay. It was, I was in elementary school, so I think I was in Alberta in the 70s? Okay, it's, yeah, I think there's a member one going through uh, Winnipeg in 1970 or so, so that's probably that one. Okay, so while you have the total eclipse, the sun is completely in front of the, uh, the moon is completely in front of the sun. It is safe to watch without eye protection. You don't want eye protection because if you're wearing that, you're going to miss this. 
this is the corona. And this is the only time that we can see this part of the sun. This is the outer part of the sun's atmosphere. And it's a pearly white. And it's sort of like that. Uh, it's, its shape can vary depending on uh, how active the sun is at the time. And it's just awesome to see from, from what I've heard. And people will just stare at that open mouth. All right, now if you're looking at it, uh, you can actually use the binoculars or telescope, but don't spend a lot of time doing this. And if you're looking at the uh, at the sun and the moon and the eclipse with them, you might see some enhancements. You can see these little red things along the side. You've probably all seen pictures of the sun that looks like flame coming off the outside. These are actually uh, hot gases called plasma, which are following the uh, magnetic field lines of the sun out and back in again. And so with some telescopes that are made for just looking at the sun, you can see these as sort of a red or orange loop coming out of there. So you can actually see these. This is hydrogen gas, and it's giving off light in the red part of the spectrum. You might be able to probably be able to see some of these with the naked eye. You could enhance it a little bit with binoculars or a telescope. But again, don't spend a lot of time doing that either. All right, so you've got those things to see. Um, and also you can see, take a look around either side of the sun, moon. And by this time, it's dark enough to see the brighter planets and the brighter stars. Maybe if we're lucky, it might be too early to tell, but I might try it now. Um, the International Space Station is perhaps making pass here. And we get to see once or well, a few times a day, we might get to see it. We don't see it in daytime, but uh, say in get in around the first days of summer you can see that up to five times a night because it takes about an hour and a half to order might even get to see a comet that would be something uh, i would really like to see to do that's one of the better parts of my hobby is seeing comets all right so we have the corona corona is going to look different it's at different stages of the solar activity right now we're heading into either this year or next year the sun will be at its most active cycle I haven't seen the sun here in St. John for a week, which is extremely long uh, for me. But um, I saw on the internet there might be nine areas on the sun with some, some sunspots. And one of them is large enough to see within a pair of eclipse glasses. Right, so near solar maximum, you see the corona like this and making several peaks out. Now, if it happens during the minimum of that 11 year cycle, it has some broader peaks coming out at the poles. And so that will change a bit. And here's what the sky is going to look like in mid-eclipse on April 8th. So we have the sun and moon here during the eclipse. Bright Venus will be down in here. And right well before we get totality, if you block the sun out, if you take your glasses off, block the sun out, you might even be able to see Venus. Venus is bright enough to be seen in daytime uh, when it's far enough away from the sun. Jupiter is going to be very bright as well. So it'll be up higher. So it should be very easy to see during totality. Over here, we've got Orion with uh, Rigel down on his knee, the ninth brightest star in the sky, seventh brightest star in the sky. Betelgeuse up here in his armpit, the red giant star. That should be bright enough. That's the 10th brightest star in the sky. Orion's belt might pop out in here. And down here is the brightest star in our night sky, Sirius. It's also the closest star that we can see at night with the uh, with their naked eye. And there'll probably be several other stars popping up. Mercury be in around here, but it might not be bright enough uh, to see with naked eye. A quick glance with binoculars might get it. And actually, there's a comet, uh, 12P Pons Brooks, that will be at its, near its brightest, but likely not bright enough to see naked eye as well. I might try to give it a quick glimpse with binoculars. I've already seen that when I saw it in, in November, but it's getting brighter now. All right, so we've got that very small period of totality. You want to take in as much of that experience, as much of that as you can. And a lot of people are photographers and they say, okay, I'm going to get my current cameras out. If this is your first or second time of seeing a total eclipse, it's highly recommended, put your camera away. You don't want to waste time playing around the camera, missing what you've got. You only got a few minutes here at the mirror machine to see this. So you want to soak up the entire experience. Uh, 
One famous astro-astronomer, maybe Canada's most famous, Alan Dyer, we have talked a couple of weeks ago. And he thought a good idea would be to get a cell phone, put it on a tripod. Once you get you know, within a minute or two of totality, and you have it pointed up toward the sun, sun and the moon. At that mm -hmm. time, there should be not enough sunlight to maybe damage it. <clears throat> but um, put it on a tripod, put it behind you. So it's also, it's also, it's catching the eclipse, but also catching you and your friends and experiencing your heaven. And that'll give you a really good thing to look back on later on. All right, so during the third contact, right? So first contact was the moon, first bites on the sun. The second contact is when totality starts. Third contact is when just when totality ends. And fourth contact is when the moon completely leaves the sun. So after third contact, you have to put your Safety glasses back on, third contact. And a lot of people go home at that time, but if you want to stick there around for another hour and five minutes or so, you get to watch the partial phases in reverse, right? Um, you can probably catch the um, Bailey's Beach and the Diamond Ring uh, just before you have to put your glasses back on. After that, you need that eye protection. Uh, watch for maybe the moon shadow heading off toward the east. And take notice it's starting to get brighter now. And gradually over the next half hour or so, it's warmer. The animals are starting to become more active. And things could be louder because you got a lot of people there, and you would likely get a lot of people up from Nova Scotia. Uh, a lot of people want to get in the cars and go home. Uh, if you want a really good uh, talk on somebody who's had experience in this, uh, if you know Mary King, Mary Mary Mishi. Mary was down in, uh, in Wyoming in 2017. People started to leave at the end of totality or at the end of the eclipse. There's no traffic moving. They were stuck in traffic for seven hours. Nothing was moving. All right, so take that into account. You're going to be there anyway, so you can probably just uh, walk home. All right, so the partial phase goes through again. So you get the fourth contact around 5.43 p.m. Maybe a couple of minutes later, you're in Mirror Machine. Only memories remain. So again, enjoy that totality while you can. Use that time to soak up that whole experience. Then be patient when you're going home and be safe. So here's the path of the, uh, of the eclipse. Here's the shadow. And so in some places it'd be a couple hundred kilometers wide, other places a little bit less. Here in New Brunswick, it's about 185 kilometers wide. It starts in the Pacific here off the coast of Mexico. And you're coming up here, All right? Uh, it's going to be about four minutes and 20 seconds or so of totality. You're through Mexico and Southern Texas. So there are people who spend a lot of money traveling around the world to see total eclipses. They have a contest or who spent the most time in the, in the moon's shadow. They can afford to travel. You're going to go here because the weather prospects are also going to be better down in here. And so it's coming up to the Mid part of the states here, it goes through southern Ontario, Hamilton's within the shadow, just off of Toronto a bit. It actually cuts through the middle of uh, Montreal, up here through uh, through Maine, and through the middle part of New Brunswick. Take it up through here, comes through the central half of New Brunswick, pretty much half of uh, Nova Scotia, or PEI, and pretty much half of the island of Newfoundland. The only part of Nova Scotia is just the little tip here of Cape Breton Island, and hopefully the snow banks will be down enough by that time so they can see the eclipse there for just for that point. It might be just uh, for 10 seconds of totality of that. And so you can imagine that there are a lot of people down in here that don't want to travel into the shadow. It's not that long a trip. They're all been coming up here, and chances are they're going to be heading up toward Mirror Machine. You know, you get maybe a 10 seconds longer over here or so and up around Heartland, they might be heading up that way for the shortest trip. Here's the shadow coming in. That's about 185 kilometers wide, moving into New Brunswick. And as soon as it's coming in, we've got the, the southern limit of the shadow here. I grew up in New Brunswick, so the southern limit runs through the middle of Macau. So I decided, I thought about going there for the eclipse and maybe start doing some public outreach there. Uh, the maximum is about 30 seconds in there. You got the uh, the famous train station there, it's about 18 seconds. 
and it runs here south of northern, uh, south of Oromoto, and a little bit north of Moncton. So when people in Moncton proper and Dieppe, they're going to have to drive a little bit north. So they're out for a drive anyway. They're probably going to come up a little bit farther. Center line of the shadow, and that's pretty close to Heartland, not too far from Doaktown, up here through pretty much through uh, close to Colette, where one of our members lives. So a lot of people, uh, a lot of people in our club are probably going up to uh, his place to watch him. And out here, so we got about uh, three minutes and uh, three nineteen seconds of totality along here in Heartland. We got about three minutes and twenty one seconds. Move up to Mayor Shee. Still very generous, somewhere around three minutes and 10 seconds. And as you're moving a little bit farther north, people in Bathurst are inside the, the northern limb of the shadow. And Grand Falls is just within inside it. So if you're in around here, you're very, very lucky. People down this area, they're probably going to try to move if they can, join the crowds and move up a little bit farther. If I stayed in St. John, this is what I would see. Well, about 99% of the sun showing here on the left-hand side of it. In Camelton, they get about the same thing on the other side. Now, the way I look at this, um, this would normally be the event of the year to have an eclipse that deep. But when you've got totality going through the province, the way I look at it is you buy a lottery ticket, you're one number off, you want $1,000. That's watching this one. Being in totality, that would having that correct number and winning a million dollars or $10 million. And so make that choice. You don't have to make that choice. You're there. You're in the money. All right, so events coming up. I was glad to hear this. I did this talk for schools there last uh, during Science Week. And they are supplying grades 5, 8, and 10 uh, in the Anglophone district with Eclipse classes. Each student and each teacher is going to get it, and they're going to have special programs for them. I teach them on the eclipse, how the eclipse has happened, eclipse safety. safety. I mentioned all the grades of them have uh, classes on eclipse safety. And a lot of places now I've heard that like Frederick, there would be, probably be some other ones giving students the day off. As you can see from the times that were going on there, a lot of students are going to be on the bus. And so they get them home early. It'll be up to the families, and hopefully they would all have their uh, eclipse classes or an equivalent be watching the uh, solar uh, eclipse safely, either the partial phase or the, the whole thing. All right, so some special lesson plans being made up for, for the schools on that. All right, so we uh, also covering areas on indigenous knowledge, and we have science and, uh, inquiry on inquiry. So they have that data literacy project where some of the students and teachers be given uh, light meters and thermometers and be going out before, during, and after totality, and even outside of the shadow as well, to measure the drop in temperature and the drop in light. So you have some actual measurements there. And to put all of those together and put them on a map in New Brunswick and see the differences there. And students can use that later on, uh, maybe next year, for uh, doing statistical projects. So we got some special events going on, and the big ones are there in Miramichi. And one of our provincial members, uh, Stephen McCarty, lives down in the Rossi area here. Two years ago, he started Cliff Valley Astronomy, uh, an astrotourism project on the side. And I think he's got enough business now that he might quit his job and do this full time. He's got far more things booked than he could do himself. So he's getting other some of the other members to help him out in that. So he's organized a three-day conference in Miramichi. So there'll be some astronomy talks going on uh, for the first time ever in the province and maybe even in the Maritimes, be a trade show where uh, companies are coming in that uh, deal in astronomical equipment, uh, you know, cameras and telescopes, binoculars, all the accessories. They will be there for that trade show and they bring in some special speakers. He's also organized a weekend and and Monday retreat, the eclipse happens on a Monday at uh, near Dope Town at a campsite there. And that's been booked up, I think, a long time ago. Most of for three days, they're having talks here, going on nature walks, things like that. Uh, in Fredericton, uh, the city has gone for that quite well. So there's a 
organized uh, of jurings at the university, at the Science East downtown, at the library, there'd be talks going on for the weekend and uh, on the day, plus public observing. Now, up in Forestville, Bristol, they've been planning this for several years. Right? First of all, they have Chris Hatfield booked to come in on the day of the eclipse. He'll be giving a presentation in the evening. They've got, uh, we're working on uh, one of our members, uh, David Hunter. He realized a few years ago that he could do a project, a pretty smart guy. He's got uh, several students at uh, UNB, grad students, involved in this as well. They're going to send up a, a, a helium balloon with a telescope attached. The telescope will have a solar filter on it and have some rig for taking that filter off during totality. And I, now, I think they've got it rigged out now so they've figured out how to keep the telescope pointed at it. That balloon's going to go up 60, 80,000 uh, uh, feet or so, and uh, or more, and be showing the eclipse. So in case there's going to be clouds, and there's a pretty good chance of that, we're going to be sending the uh, the cameras, will be sending down the feet, the live feed down there, and they'll be showing in, in different areas on the ground. So if it happens to be clouded, you can watch the eclipse live from that uh, from that balloon project. And they'll also have, uh, if it's clear there, they'll also have public observing. You know, Amir Mashi, I believe the public observing is going to be at the airport. I'm expecting uh, like a few thousand people there. It could very well be more. And you know, all those people coming up from Nova Scotia, that might be the spot they're going to. Uh, the center of the eclipse passes through the northern tip of Cushman Park. So, depending on the road quality and uh, Things like that in there, there might be a lot of people going to that area. Okay, so these, this is what's happening there. Any questions so far? Seems not, no. Okay, good. Saves me making a fool of myself. <laughs> oh, talk a bit about eye safety. Okay, here's our eye. Now, if you look and uh, read some materials on eye safety and the, and the sun, you might read where the it's the actually the infrared or the sort of the ultraviolet and infrared portion of the sunlight that causes the damage. So we get all different wavelengths of light coming from the sun. You even get some gamma rays, X rays. You get uh, far side get radio waves, you know, microwaves. All this coming from the sun. And what comes into our eyes, you have the uh, the ultraviolet doesn't get beyond much beyond here. The cornea gets stays in here. So that's really not going to cause a lot of damage in the inner part of the eye because it's pretty much taken there. But chronic exposure of ultraviolet light will cause cataracts. It takes a while, but it will cause cataracts in your eyes. Now, the infrared can come in and cause damage. But what causes the most damage is actually the visible light, you know, the red to uh, violet light in our, in our rainbow. And our eyes are most sensitive to the green part of the uh, spectrum. So we have a retina back here. In the retina we have, in here in the middle, we have the uh, cone cells. This is our daylight cells. Right? So they have three different types, red, green, and blue. So they're looking for wavelengths of light uh, that correspond to red, green, or blue. So the, the blue ones, if they see a wavelength of light like that, the cells here will absorb that particular wavelength of light and you have a photochemical reaction. So it absorbs that and sends an electric signal to your brain. And the red ones will do that for the red band of wavelengths, green ones for the green band of wavelengths. Color doesn't have any light whatsoever. Ultraviolet, infrared, X-rays, gamma rays. There's no color at all in that. What we see for color is done in the brain. All right, so it's all in our heads. There's no color coming in. Our brains work out the color based on the types of signals coming in from those cells and uh, the amount of it in each one. So it works that out and gives you the color that you see. Now in a circle around that, we have the rod cells. Now, there are many more of them. They're all bundled together, but there's no color involved in them. It's all just shades of gray, just gray, but they're much more sensitive to light. And so if you go in and say a room with a little room, get the light on, close the door, you shut the light off, you can't see anything. 
gradually over a little bit of time, you start to pick up seeing shapes. And after you know, 10 minutes or so, you can actually see things a little bit better. This is the rod cells coming into focus. Right? So they're building up this particular chemical in those. And as soon as you say, open the door, turn the light on, they get flashed with all of that uh, energy coming in there, absorbing that light, sending the photochemical uh, signals into the brain. And you sort of get flash blindness like that for a little while. And so that's our night vision there. You notice you go out at night, you stay around a while. That's what astronomers use for looking at painting things in the sky. So what happens when you get light coming in? If you're looking at the sunlight and have no eye protection, that light coming in there, they can overwhelm your cone cells and your red cells, wipes them right out. Right? They've been uh, too much energy get in there and they're gonna be out of service. Could be a couple of days, could be several weeks. You we really don't know. And the thing about it is, there are no pain cells there. You're not gonna feel any difference. And when you're looking at eclipses, you're talking about eclipses, it's just sunlight. So it's no different without an eclipse as it is with an eclipse. Just that during an eclipse, you have something to look at. But nobody goes out and stares at the sun, although some have done that. Apparently, a lot of people back in the 60s taking acid had a thing where they're staring at the sun and they had some permanent eye damage. Right? So if you're looking at the sun for any you know, short length of time, you're going to have some damage down to your eyes and your cone cells and your red cells. It might be short, you know, temporary, could be a, a longer period, probably won't be permanent. Right? But you really don't want anything to happen to your eyes. And if it's the longer you stare at it, the worse the problem is going to be. Now, if you haven't been looking at the sun with a telescope or binoculars, right, with no protection on it, no filters, it's much more intense light coming in there. It will wipe those, uh, knock those cells out even, even worse. But even worse than that, all the material in around here, around those cells, will absorb that visible light and re-emit it as infrared light which is heat, and you'll actually get tissue in there being cooked by the sunlight. So you got out infrared light coming in on its own, which can do that, plus even worse, coming in from the visible light being turned into infrared, and you could have permanent damage to your eyes there very, very quickly. You have blisters forming inside your eyes, and you won't notice it again until several hours later, maybe even the next day, and you wake up and there's a black spot in front of your eye. Chances are you're going to be completely blind, but you're going to have that black spot, one eye, both eyes, and you really don't want that to happen. All right, so staring at the sun will cause temporary or permanent eye damage quickly. You'll not feel pain or notice the problem until hours later. During the partial phase of the eclipse, there is something to see. The intensity is less, but you still have your eyes are, are going to be uh, very, very tiny, the, the iris in there. The pupil because it's still very, very bright, even when there's a little bit of sunlight left. So it's only during to tell you when the moon covers the sun completely, or maybe a second or two before that, when it's safe to look at the sun without the proper safety equipment. So heed that. All right, things to look at the sun safely. Now, there's a big business here in, in eclipses, and I know that the mirror machine. Uh, the city has gone out and bought many of these as well. Um, different areas are the guy that's was coming up there, um, Stefan. He's uh, actually a dealer for one of the companies, reputable companies that make these American paper products. Another company is uh, Rainbow Symphony. Right, so he'll have a, a bunch of those as well. Right, so with these. Got one here, if you can still see me in the corner there. Like this, I'll come fold it out like that. There'll be two places on the side here where you can fold them. So if you got a, a fat head, you want to set them out in the other one. Normally, uh, you'd be on the other one, depending on how wide your head is. So you're going to look at the sun. Don't look at the sun, just put them on first, and then look up toward the sun. As long as you're looking at the sun, you want to have those on. If you want to look at something else, Turn your head away from it, 
remove it without waking up the sun. The other thing you get, uh, these are the cardboard ones. They're not all that expensive. Although some people probably are the uh, scalp you as you're getting closer. You also make uh, plastic ones like this. You know, big uh, kind of wraparound shades. That'd be good for looking at the beach, but it's not something you're going to drive with. Because I can't see a darn thing with these on. They only have the sun. So you have something on that you think will work. And if you can see something else uh, through it other than the sun, they're probably not strong enough to use. With something like this, I have a look at a 200 watt bulb and I was just able to see the filaments. Those filaments are very, very hot. Uh, it was safe to use these and it had a stronger one as well from a telescope. I could see the filaments through that. <clears throat> so if there's not enough for everybody, it's okay to share those. You see, unless you're really worried about, uh, so about COVID. If you're among your family, you're probably safe doing that. If you need to buy some, yeah, you better get on it now. It might be tough to buy some now anyway because there are, a lot of the places could be sold out. Back in 2017, there were people that were scamming and having selling them through uh, Amazon. Now, to be uh, certified, the safe, they need to have this number, the ISO number 12312-2. The dash two is made for Eclipse glasses. Like dash one is for regular sunglasses. Right, so if they don't have that, ISO 12312-2 stamped on it, and you might have a date as well, like 2015. Uh, don't buy them, don't use them. And so there were that some being sold on eBay or, you know, eBay or even through Amazon in 2017, and people discovered that these aren't safe enough. So they informed Amazon and, and they took those ones down. So just beware. And the ones that are being brought in are bought through the reputable place, reputable dealers are what you're probably going to have there in mirror machine. If you want to know who a reputable dealer is, there's a American Astronomical Association, I know American Astronomical Society, AAS, go to their website and they have a list of reputable dealers. Alternatively, uh, you can use a welder shade, but the darkest shade is a number 14, right? And that is perfectly safe to, to watch the sun in. And you want one that's wide enough to cover both eyes. Yeah, they have uh, welding helmets that have variable shades on there. They're probably not safe because there's no guarantee that you're going to get that number 14 or 13 shade uh, by looking at the sun. Make sure you just get the glasses. These are probably very difficult to pick up. Um, it's also what they don't normally say, but it's also safe as a number 13 shade. And number 13 shade is pretty much equivalent to those uh, Eclipse glasses. People might find them a little more comfortable. Some will find the 14 shade a little, maybe a little too dark. Do not use sunglasses or several sunglasses. They are not made for staring at the sun. Okay. Meant for casual glimpses, things like that, but you don't use them for staring at the sun. I saw a picture of somebody in 2017 or so that wearing five pair of sunglasses and watching it. I don't know if anything happened to him, but he's somebody, somebody called stupid and lucky. And you do not do this. For somebody with eclipse glasses, they are not made. If you're going to look at the sun with binoculars or a telescope, these eclipse glasses do not give you anywhere near the protection that you need. So you need a special filter that goes on the front of the binoculars or telescope. Other things you can do safely, uh, indirect viewing. A lot of people have probably done this before. So one thing you do is take a piece of cardboard, a fairly big piece, so maybe give you a, a good shadow coming down for a little bit more contrast. Cut a little hole out in the middle of it. doesn't need to be big. And then tip a piece of tinfoil over the hole. When you do that, then take a needle, poke a little hole in the middle of the tinfoil. And if you hold that up, your back to the sun, hold up over your, over your shoulder, and have somebody holding this or set up a screen, so a big piece of white cardboard or something else like that, gives you some pretty good contrast. 
and you adjust the distance of your the cardboard you're holding from that to focus the view on there, and you get a nice view of the sun. And there you probably be able to see the sunspots on that. You're not going to see the uh, see the prominences on the outside those red ones. But all you'll, you'll see a white sun with black spots on it. As you're, as you're going through the partial phases, and then you'll see the total eclipse there, just the, the black dot in the middle. You might just get you with the dark one there. You might get to see a bit of the chroma. Now the reason you use the tin foil is because if you poke a hole through the cardboard, cardboard's not going to make a, a nice clean hole there. You're probably going to have a little shreds of cardboard around it. That would give you a fuzzy picture. But with tin foil, you should get a nice sharp little hole like that. By moving this back and forth, you can maybe adjust the size of what you're seeing. When you get in focus, maybe as big as you can get while it's still in focus. The other thing you do, you can hold your hands together like that. Let the sunlight come through. Get your back to the sun. Project that onto a, say a white screen. And you get a, a bunch of small eclipses you can look at there. What's happened in nature and for years, you see a bunch of eclipses on the sidewalk. These are all caused by pores in a tree nearby here, pores in the leaves. That'd be a good thing to try most of the time, but uh, April 8th in New Brunswick, we're not likely to have uh, trees with leaves on them like that. The thing you do is say, watch it on television or the internet. My first experience was in 1963. Uh, I thought it was a total eclipse, but it wasn't. It was total in Maine, but not in New Brunswick. We had a deep partial one. And so I watched it on, on television. It wasn't until about 20 years ago that I realized it was only partial here in New Brunswick. All right, so telescopes and binoculars, you can safely look at the sun with those, provided you have a proper solar filter on the front of it. Now, here's a funny looking, but regular size, regular type uh, reflector telescope it's called a NastroScan. And I look at the sun as many days as I can, and I'm averaging about 250 times a year. So I take that out and look at the sun through this and sketch the sunspots that I see. And Here's the filter on the front of it, it's taped down. It looks like tin foil, but it's not. It's a special polycarbonate material. Check that for any damage to it. And if you're using the eclipse glasses, uh, they're quite sturdy. But make sure you test them out first. Look for any uh, holes poked into it. Right? You see some holes. You might see some scratches there, but usually their uh, scratches aren't going to be deep enough to cut right through it. So they should still be good. But check them out before you use them. And so if you have binoculars or a telescope, you need special filters on here, except during a very, very brief total phases. And you probably don't want to spend a lot of time looking at that with a telescope or binoculars easy uh, as well. Maybe a quick look with binoculars to see something going on. And spend most of the time looking through naked eye. So the bonus coming up, mention we have the uh, activity of the sun, it's 11 year sunspot cycle is coming to a maximum late this year, early next year. So there should be a lot of sunspots on there. So it gives you something extra to watch for the partial phases. You see the moon, the moon coming on here, gradually covering up some of these. And if you have a hydrogen alpha telescope, one of these here, especially made just for the sun. So it just lets you a narrow part of the sunlight in the red part of the spectrum. So the sun's going to look red or orange to you. And with that, you can see these prominences on the outside. So you'll see those covered up by the sun as well. The weather prospects. Blue in here. This is a average cloud cover, percent cloud cover. So the dark blue, you have an average roughly 20% cloud cover. As you're coming up through Texas, in the middle part of the states, as it gets worse and worse, and up here in New Brunswick, we're looking at 80 to 90 percent cloud cover for this time of year. Uh, if you're on the coast, it could be a little bit better because the winds coming off the coast will tend to keep the, uh, the clouds back a bit. So anybody traveling around the world, uh, from the world, to see the eclipse, you're going to be down in here. Okay? Most of our traffic will be from Nova Scotia. 
All right, the last time we had an eclipse in New Brunswick, July 10th, 1972. Some of you might have caught that. And so it came down here. So Karaket was at the middle part of it. I mentioned before, Newcastle was outside, Chatham was inside. And it went down just the narrow bit here of Nova Scotia, of New Brunswick on the eastern shore and across into the upper half of Nova Scotia, cutting out most of Cape Breton Island. And before that, we haven't had one in New Brunswick since at least before 1900 and maybe before uh, year 10,000 or say 1,000. Our next one, I'll be 126 years old. So if I miss this one, I'm going to eat well, take care of myself. May 1st, 2079. Uh, Miramichi's out of it this time. St. John is in it. Frederick is just on outside of it there. Center part of it runs up through the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia. I have a daughter living in there, so if she's still there and I'm still alive, maybe I can go there. But chances are going to be very, very slim for part of that. Okay. Now, a little bit of trivia here. Um, that wobble that the moon makes, it makes one wobble every 18.6 years. All right, so you've got that. You've got the from one new moon to the next new moon, that's 29 and a half days. And the, uh, the apogee or the perigee point of the, of the moon, that also changes. All right, so that moves along the moon's orbit, makes one complete revolution about 8.85 8 8 years. So all of these can come together and be very, very close, one full, let's uh, say, roundup uh, every 18 years and um, 10 or 11 days, depending on how many leap years you've had in there, how many leap days. That means you have an eclipse that's very, very uh, similar to one that happened 18 years ago. This is 18 years, 10 or 11 days plus eight hours. So you have the same path of an eclipse, but it's happening eight hours say, later, which means it's one third of the way around the Earth. And it, Another period like that, another what they call Saros. It's another eight, eight uh, hours or a third away around there. But every 45, uh, 54 years in one month, if you give or take a day, it's back into here. You get that path, same path coming up through here and roughly the same distance. Everything's not completely lined up. As the center point would be maybe a thousand kilometers above or below where it was before. So here's one in March 7th, 1970. Came up the eastern coast of Nova Scotia. The Brunswick wasn't in it. As you can see, it's the same path being followed. That's that 54 years and one month later, we have April 8th of this year. This is a very famous eclipse in, uh, say, in some areas. Any, new, any reason why? Can you think of it? Uh, shrugging of shoulders is all I see. Pardon me? Shrugging of shoulders is all we're getting. Okay. Oh, wait, wait. wait. Give you a clue. Think of a song. Wait. I, if I recall correctly, it was about the time of um, uh, the release of uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, that'd be, that was 1969. <laughs> All right, think of Maybe music. Just it to the Miramichi then. Yeah. <laughs> think of music. Oh, what about Carly Simon? I thought that Carly was Simon, yes. Your Sylvain. Oh. Um, one of her suitors, that there, I think there are three suitors mentioned in that song. Warren Beatty is one of them. I think one of her managers is one. Mick Jagger's not, and James Taylor's not. And, but they mentioned about the go to Sarasota, there's horse one. Flew in his Lear jet up to Nova Scotia to catch a total eclipse of the sun. Very that, good. Uh, that song was written in wow. 1971. <laughs> now, the one that you saw maybe in 72, right? some people think that was it, but the song was written before the 1972 eclipse. And if I were there, I'd, I'd give the winner a couple of eclipse classes, but I'm not. So I'll just give you a hand. We have some, it's okay. <laughs> okay, good. In the city or? 
sorry, no, um, Mary King. Okay, Mary's got some great. Yeah. yeah. So there, any questions? Um, I, I guess I'm a, a little concerned. You say that it's, I don't, I've, I have the mic's somewhat remote for me, but you say that it's um safe during the total eclipse to not use the glasses. Yep, yeah, it's a little the scary. Pardon me? Well, it's a little scary because yeah. you, you never know. I know it's quite predictable, obviously, but yeah, uh, you'd be taking a chance, would you not? Well, you um. Once this, the moon totally covers it, it's perfectly safe because there's no light coming from it. Now, have you ever taken a glimpse of the sun? I think we've probably all done that. Sometime or other, or many times, even if it's a clear day, take a quick look at it. And meeting. So when you're watching the total eclipse, if you, uh, if you time it, you know when to stop looking, but watching a clock or watching your watch, right. things like that, Right now, I wouldn't do it. So as soon as you start to see, maybe, okay, it's getting a little bit brighter there, that's the time to put them on. Yeah. You might have a, it might be a split second or something like that. And that's not enough really to cause any of that damage. Uh, maybe from what all we've heard over the years, uh, we've always been very, very um, conservative about this. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, so just when you start to see the thing on that first Maybe a sunlight, then put everything back on. Or if you're a little bit more nervous, uh, put them back on before you think that's going to happen. So you say, Mary Bichy, we'll get about three minutes and 10 seconds? Roughly about that. I think the last one I looked, I think it was about 310, yeah. Okay. Right. And there might be somebody in a crowd here. They're in a crowd. There's probably going to be somebody there doing a timing to give you a heads up. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, what's going to happen. If one was at the the uh, airport, for instance, you mean? I would think, yeah. There's uh, typically there'd be somebody there that's yeah, okay. looking after that, but maybe not. Okay. It's I up to I, it's up to the individual. I remember watching the 1972 eclipse. Okay. And how I watched it, um, we were out at East Point, a little east of Chatham, and I had a a magnifying glass that was about four inches. Diameter, so a good big magnifying glass. Yeah. And I project the sun onto the bleached bone of a moose jaw. <laughs> that would be a great picture. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get a picture of it? No. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> Only in Canada. Eh? <laughs> More smartphones. Yeah. <laughs> Any other? What about cameras? For, what about photography? Photography, well, as I said before, it's best to not do that. You want to spend your time just taking things in. Now, if you want to do the uh, partial phase of it, uh, you would need uh, a filter on the front of your camera. And they make some for cameras. They're maybe just a little bit less uh, than for the uh, front of a telescope. Or if you got one for in front of your telescope, um, you can use that. But the eclipse glasses are probably not enough to keep you from damaging your camera. And if you're doing something, you don't want to be looking directly at the sun, say through a viewfinder or anything like that. So a lot of cameras now have the uh, like the little screen on them, so you want to be watching that way. Now, if the but it hurt, it might be okay. So you figure. Your cell phone camera there. If you uh, have the uh, eclipse glasses, maybe have a spare one. Maybe cut off one of the eyepieces of it and tape that to your uh, cell phone on the front-facing one. Right then, you can hold that up toward the sun, and say holding your phone up in front of you, you can watch the uh, eclipse safely that way. So you got the you got that eclipse glass on the front of your cell phone camera, just in that part there, and you're looking at the picture through that. That'd be safe. Okay, that's a good idea. Okay. Yeah, but uh, I haven't seen any studies on on doing that. I've just seen the picture, and uh, people have said that it is safe to do that for safe for your phone there. So. But but as you say, you'll be fiddling with that because it's the first time of doing it. And you missed the whole show. So. Yeah. 
but during the partial phases, if you want to watch that go through like that, uh, and actually could maybe recording video of it or taking pictures of it along the way. So once it's total, you may want to grab a, have the filter off and maybe grab one or two very quickly. You probably have a pretty wide field of view there. A couple of quick ones like that, but don't spend a lot of time playing with cameras. It's the first time, second time you want to just enjoy watching it. Well, I, I've got a question. Where do you think you're going to be on the... <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought about uh, McAdam, do some outreach there. But then I got to... Uh, I do a lot of outreach. I'm gonna. It's, it's a me day, so I've got a brother in Nakawick, and it's uh, two minutes and fifty two seconds there. So we're having a family gathering up there on that day. That'll be fun. Okay. Yeah. You'll you'll take the day off then, sort of. I'm long retired. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I wasn't, I'd be taking the day off. <laughs> We had an annual eclipse here in 1994. I took the day off. <laughs> we have a question? Yeah. Yeah, I have a pair of eclipse glasses right now, and where we live, uh, the sun is setting right after mm. all the, every day. So is there anything wrong with me just using those glasses and looking at the sun regularly? Regularly? Not a bit. Yeah, in fact, it's a good idea to try them out. Okay. Yep. Sunlight during the eclipse is uh, well, chances are going to be down a little bit, but even during a nice sunny day, they are safe to use. Don't spend a lot of time staring at it, but uh, you know, for a couple of minutes or so, no problem at all. During the eclipse, you're not going to be spending that entire hour and five minutes watching it go. You're going to be chatting with friends, things like that, or maybe even sharing the glasses. So I, I do take them out. And if you get a sunny day tomorrow, I encourage you to go out, maybe see if you can see that big sunspot through those glasses. Mary uses a phrase, and you probably do too, duck and dawn. Duck your head down when you put your glasses on. Okay. Duck and dawn. No, I, that's a good one. I, I've never used it. I think I've heard Mary say it before, yeah. Or well, maybe Mary invented it. Could be. She has far more experience in the total eclipses than I have. She has seen one. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know if there are any more questions, um, but thank you very much for taking time. It's a very busy time for you, I'm sure. And I think we've really appreciated uh, this insight, so to speak, um, of what's going to be happening. Okay, uh, well, thank you for uh, well, the invitation allowing me to do this. This is what I'd love to do. Outreach is a strange hobby, and outreach is the, the best part of it. So right. If anybody has any questions, maybe you can just get my uh, email from uh, or I, you or maybe from Pam. Yeah, and, I can do that. You know. I'll, I'm going to share the video anyway. Okay. I'll, I'll do that at the same time. Yeah. Okay, great. Wonderful. Well, I hope you get clear skies on April 8th. I'm sure. Yeah, don't, uh, you kinda, <laughs> you've discouraged us a little bit, I'm afraid, but... Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, okay. Good thing is, well, don't, go don't run out and buy tickets to Texas either. So, <laughs> just all you need, even if it's partly cloudy, it's still going to look good. And it's totally cloudy, you still get to experience that period of darkness for a few minutes. Yes. So the things going on in nature are still going to go on. Yeah. Okay. So it cannot be a a, a big disappointment, a complete disappointment then. Yeah, you only have to wait till 2079 to short trip to see it again. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Kurt. You're welcome. See ya. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.